Preseason is finally over. Let's get the season started today on Night of the Shield. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Night of the Shield. I'm Jason Smith, a.k.a. The Knight, and you're watching Night of the Shield. If you're new here, please hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you can be updated every time I drop another episode. And hit that like button. Let's continue to get the word out. This is a different type of show. At least I'm trying to make it that way. Uh, I am trying to come at this from a completely different perspective this year put more thought into it. That's why I'm not making a whole lot of videos yet. They may pick up as the season goes on, but right now I'm primarily focused on making sure that anything that I think of, anything that I'm processing, I have a better understanding from a fan's perspective, first and foremost. And then from there, we could talk about some of the, I guess, analytical stuff that may or may not come out during this process. But let's start there. What did you all get out of preseason? What did you get all? What did you guys get out of that Niner game this past weekend? Not much, right? I'm going to talk about Gainer. Are we going to talk about all the players that showed up on tape? Are we the McAllisters? Are we, are we going to talk about them? Are we going to talk about the people, Janarius Robinson off the edge? Are we are we going to talk about these players and these players alone? How often? How many times have we fell in love with a certain player? in the preseason. What has that really got us? Nothing. Sometimes they don't even make the team. What happens if any one of those three players that I mentioned here, just throughout this opening, don't even make the team? Maybe not even make the practice squad. Or better yet, just like what usually happens, we put them on a practice squad, and then they get plucked right away. Happens all the time. This staff has a decision to make, a lot of decisions to make. And there's so much that goes into their process, and it looks completely different than what we do. It looks completely different than what members of the media process and what they do. Now, I would even go as far as saying every, everybody has a say, everybody has a thought, everybody has an opinion, and your opinion is yours. But the same way that I watch a lot of media people that I truly do respect, they give me information that... I would not be pervy to if it wasn't for them being able to have boots on the ground, see it for their own eyes and report on it, right? We wouldn't have some of the information that we got. A lot of the stuff that we talk about, damn near everything we talk about comes from somebody in the media, period, period. So you cannot discredit these guys that, that, that went to school, that put themselves in position to be able to cover this team, literally, from being the boots on the ground, Okay. For a lot of us that choose to sit here and talk Raider football and be analytical or opinionative or whatever, whatever you, you, choose, you choose who you want to be and how you want to present yourself here on YouTube. It's your prerogative. But we wouldn't exist if those people didn't exist. Got it? But even they're not pervy to all the information. Yeah, they talk to Antonio Pierce. Yes, they talk to Luke Getze. They talk to Tom Telesco. They talk to Patrick Graham. They talk to the players. They give a lot of inside scoop but everybody's perspective is going to be different. Max Crosby is going to view something differently than Devontae Adams. Devontae Adams is going to view something different than Gardner Minshew or Antonio Pierce or Tom Telesco, Luke Gexy, Patrick Graham. You get it? The list goes on and on and on and on. There's a pecking order in our house. It's just the way it is. And it starts with Tom Telesco. This is his football team. And he might not have been able to select the coach, but it don't matter. It don't matter. And the, the thing that makes Antonio Pierce great, in my opinion, is I believe Antonio Pierce knows who he is. He knows what his strengths are now, and he knows where he wants to go and where he wants to be and how he's going to strengthen himself to get there. That's why he's bringing and surrounding himself with people who've done it in the past at a high level and were very successful in their life, like Herm Edwards, right? Tom Coughlin. He surrounds himself around people that are going to help him make some of these decisions and understand it from different perspectives. He's not out there thinking he has all the answer because he's been given the, 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 the authority to be the Raiders' head coach. His job is his job, and he takes it seriously, and he leans on, he leans on his, his team, his players, his coaches, his staff, and their strengths. 
That is a sign of a very good and solid leader. And yes, he would even lay it down and listen to Tom Telesco. I believe it. I believe it. Say what you want about the Chargers. I can't stand them. I think they're a joke. I think they're a plague. It really stems from their ownership more than anything else. More than anything else. And we've seen that across this league for generations. And we're going to continue to see it for generations, right? Some will figure it out. Some will figure it out for a short time. Every leadership team is different. And the Chargers have just been struggling since their franchise was in existence. And and they're continuing to do it to this day. It starts with ownership. Tom Telesco brought a lot of talent on that football team. It's still loaded. It's still very talented. A guy like Jim Harbaugh would not have taken that job if it didn't have some of the pieces or most of the pieces that he felt were there quarterback being one of them. Telesco knows this is a long game. This ain't the short game. You don't sell out yet. We weren't ready to make a Super Bowl run. Not literally. Doesn't mean we can't. I think we lose perspective in that too sometimes. You know, we we have to be somewhere on the board. We feel like we got to land somewhere on the board. Like, oh no, we are going to be a Super Bowl contender. No, no, we, we just know now, we're thinking too far ahead. We're not there yet, but we do want to make a run at the Chiefs and at least make a wild card. Right? No, we're going to suck because we didn't go get the quarterback and now all of our, our chances are down the window. Yeah, there's so many different factors. Just like there's so many different factors of why you're going to keep this player versus this player or because this guy is more like a Swiss Army knife and this guy's one-dimensional or this guy's really good in the film room, but he doesn't know how to translate it to practice or this guy's great on the field, but he doesn't study and he makes a lot of mistakes because he doesn't study. We don't, we're not, we're not pervy to some of this information. Either is the media. They may catch wind of it. Someone may talk because they heard something or someone's putting something out there in the universe, but very rarely do we hear about the inner workings. These guys watch and grade everything from the way they conduct themselves on the field, off the field, during practice, during games, the way they're processing information. Are they leaders? Are they not leaders? Are they coachable? Are they not coachable? Are they arrogant? And all they want to do is think that they they should be given to them because they have a physical ability versus a mental ability. There's so many different reasons why a coach or a general manager will go to bat for a certain player or feel like it would make more sense to keep this. And and let's, and let's not, let's not forget this element too, right? Financials, financials play a big part on how your team is built and how you maintain a football team. So you may keep, right, that extra wide receiver because there's a good chance that, I don't know, I'm going to do something very controversial right now, and I don't believe this to be the case unless it all starts, unless the wheels fall off. But just in, in, in the regards of, you know, maybe you do trade Devontae Adams before the trade line. And if you don't trade him this year, maybe you decide to move on from him next year because, you seem to be really talented at the wide receiver position and your skill player positions with tight ends and running backs that can catch the ball and do all these different things that you start to think, hey, are we going to pay this guy all this 40s of millions of dollars and just keep him on for the next two? Or do we try to get a little something back, get us some more pieces in here to keep this thing going? The good teams know when to cut ties and when not to. And we got to stop saying, well, Devontae wanted to be a Raider. He grew up a Raider fan. Uh, he grew up in, in Palo Alto, which was, you know, by the Bay, and he grew up a Raider fan, so he needs to be a Raider for the rest of his career. No, you don't. Those days are over. It took me a long time to accept that. It took me a long time to accept that. And when I personally, I, I, I try to get, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to make a point here and, and about this Niner game in, in, in general too, yes, but this the preseason as a whole. It was funny, man. And I don't know if it's because we're in Vegas now, you know, I still I still see I still see the Niners and their jerseys, and I, I have so many family members and friends being from the Bay and just 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 having that in my environment. That man, I just I don't like the football team, and I don't think I ever will. But it doesn't carry the same weight anymore. This is not even the Raiders in LA at this point, man. This is the Raiders in Las Vegas. It's a completely different vibe, completely different vibe. When we moved to Oakland to LA, it solidified our vibe. It, it, it created the culture that we've come to love and, and, and respect. And Vegas is just the home now, right? Vegas has become home base. And it has its problems, and it's, it also has its, its positive things too, financially and 
geographically and a team that's being recognized across the league in a different light is just making us a more well-rounded organization. But the Raider Niner matchup, I didn't get the same vibes as I did. And when it ended in a tie, I couldn't help but laugh. I'm by, by all means, I've never been and never will be a conspiracy theorist ever. It's not who I am. And I know a lot of people might want to take that stance of, oh, you know, the league is rigged. Yeah. And we could look at this too with all the drama and all the problems that's happened over the year between these two franchises and the fights and the, and all the turmoil that happens. And, you know, if there's a winner and a loser, I mean, people, people can get, really get into this whole mess. Right. And we end in a tie. So now you can't even go to work and pound your chest and be like, yeah, yeah, you know, and I I know it's still going to happen, right? Well, your starters didn't get that, the best of our second, third string guys. We kind of held our own. We we picked off Brock Purdy. There's a lot of stuff we could say, but at the end of the day, it's all hogwash. It means nothing. It literally means zilch, zero, zero. And I'm okay with it now. The younger me, not so much. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have accepted this tie, to be honest with you. So if you're one of those guys still coming up, still young, still got the fire, dude, I say go for it, man. Like live it. Be upset, dude. Like want preseason, want to own the Niners no matter what the time of day is, right? But honestly, like I said, it don't matter. It literally does not matter. This is not going to dictate our season. This doesn't mean that we're, you know, okay, here, here, here's another focal point, right? Stopping the run. It hasn't looked good. Should we be concerned? Sure. We should be concerned. It needs to be fixed. But what's better, right? Thinking we got it right in the preseason and then find out that it's not right in the regular season? Or would you rather notice now, two weeks before the where everything's on the line for good, that you know what? Your primary focus better be that run game because I guarantee you Jim Harbaugh and boys are going to come running at you. They are. We already know. They're going to at least try to settle settle that game on the ground first and foremost. So, you know, especially with Herbert not being 100%. And we haven't shown in the preseason that we could do it, so we're going to be challenged. I'd rather know that now than to know it in week two going against the Ravens in the Harbaugh era parent, John Harbaugh, right? Jim and John back-to-back. Two very good coaches, very smart coaches, very good game managers, game planners. You know, we got Andy Reid in our division. Now we got Harbaugh in our division. Sean Payton, I'm still on the fence, man. Some people can come back and continue to be that guy, and then some other people struggle with it. And, it, and as of late, he's, he's struggling. So we'll, we'll see how he puts it together this year. The verdict's still out on him. If he can't put something together that looks a little different this year, then you know, maybe, maybe Sean Payton is joining the ranks of the once was is right? But at the end of the day, we got to take care of our own. And the best way that we could do it is know there's a problem and fix it before it really matters. And that's what preseason is about. Once again, we're going right back to it. We can't get caught up. You, you know why? Do you know why I love preseason season so much? Why I really enjoy getting into the preseason games? Because I like talking football and I like talking about this team and I like trying to figure things out. I like, I like challenging myself to see if I even get close to being right. How close can I get to being on target? It's not about, hey, what I say, I know, and I'm going to analytically break this down and tell you exactly where the problem's at. And Dylan Labe should be cut because he fumbled the football. The guy got schlacked, dude. <laughs> Welcome to the NFL, Labe, right? Like, again, it's a learning lesson. I'd rather that happen to him now than when, again, when it counts. Now he's got something to think about. He's got something to work on. Right. Him being on that pedestal, he's no longer on it. He knows that he's in the National Football League and he's got some work to do. Hell, it's an eye opener to us fans to say this kid is a rookie and he's got things to work on. He's not going to be the Christian McCaffrey everybody wants to tag him as. He's not. He's not that dude yet. Doesn't mean he can't be a player like a McCaffrey or a very solid contributor to this football team. It just means he's got a lot to learn. We found the same thing out about Michael Mayer last year. I'm, I'm excited to see Michael Mayer this year. Year two, there's usually a big jump, and that dude is a big physical specimen. He's got the skill set to be a very, very powerful playmaking tight end in the National Football League, and you're pairing him with another guy 
who who may be even good right now in Brock Bowers. And then all the weapons around him, right? So so much to look forward to. But a lot of these guys, they need that come to the NFL moment. Lobby got his. Okay. So be it. Right? Now, now when we strap the cleats on and the ball is hiked for real, you got something to work on, dude. You got you got goals. You got goals in front of you. Now go get them. Go get them. Man, I could talk all day about the general, that my, like my, my whole thought process as I process preseason, as we get ready to head into the regular season, week one, Los Angeles Chargers, like here we go. And man, I'm going to take the opportunity right now. At some point in this video, when I was talking about the Chargers earlier, if I mentioned San Diego, just laugh with me, dude. I cannot get over it. Every time I talk about the Chargers, that, that, that the San Diego thing comes up. So if I said it, I try to catch it before I do, but uh, screw the edit. I'm not editing it out. I'm just going to leave it in. But anyway, I don't even know if I did it or not. That's how bad it is these days. But I just want everybody to calm down. When the 53-man roster is released, we know exactly where we're going to be looking at. And let's be honest, you know, if they didn't play, if the, some of the players that we've talked about through the course of this process or other channels have talked about, and you didn't see them strap it up and play, you already know they're on the 53. And there's just one name in particular that stands out to me in my head. DJ Turner. There you go. Done deal. He's on this football team. Guarantee you this man makes this football team. There's just no way. Otherwise, he would have been out there competing against everybody else. Now, McAllister, Keaton, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made, some, some pretty hard ones, in fact. How many should they keep of one position versus the other? There's talk about only carrying two quarterbacks. As risky as it may sound, you could always bring one up in, in an emergency-type situation, and you have Jacoby Myers that has uh, the ability to throw the football and has some running ability. So, you know, he could obviously be that third option in an emergency. I almost like the idea I think he's thinking outside the box a little bit. That's a rumor that I heard that I'm like totally on board with because I don't think Bradley's ready and I don't think Peterman's the answer either. And this gives us time to develop on the practice squad even. You can keep Bradley on the practice squad. It looked like the guy has some arm talent and some skill there. So just continue to develop him. And in case of emergency, Jacoby Myers gets you through that last bit of the game and then you bring that dude up. So again, like I, I, I'm hearing all of these rumors and these rumblings and in the bottom line is, and the other thing I was focused on is the, this, this organization seems to be making more thoughtful planned out decisions. And I'm, I've been enjoying that process thus far. Like I don't feel like we're, we're very erratic or, or, or pushing the envelope, you know I mean? This is going to be the hardest part of Antonio Pierce's football career, not just his coaching career, this is going to be some of the biggest moments of his football career in these next few days because he's going to have to make some decisions that he hasn't necessarily had to make at this level before. There's going to be a lot of people that he likes, a lot of people that he saw some great things from, and he's going to want to keep them around. He's going to want them to be a part of this football team, and they may or may not even make it to our practice squad just due to – that's a good problem to have, by the way. But, you know, he's going to have to let some people go. And hopefully that they can reunite someday down the road if, if they get the opportunity to come back and we bring them back because now there's that opening, that need. But, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard on him. I know that he, in the past he's sh he shown great resolve. If you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, then, okay, you're gone. We're cutting you. This is a completely different scenario. This is, this is a guy that may have really put everything he had on the line. Remember where Antonio Pierce comes from, undrafted, had to prove himself, go out there and work for everything that he's got. So he respects guys that are laying it out, but either they're ready or they're not. He's seen the other side of that coin. He's going to have a different perspective of all these coaches and all these people that he was around his whole career. He's going to have a completely different perspective, and it may even change the way that he coaches and a different understanding of both sides of the field. That, that could be the very factor that makes him something special. I hope so. That's, that is the goal. That is the dream. That is the idea. Bring back that Raider mystique. Bring back something that we could lay our hat on and say, you know what? This is it. 
But if you're upset that we tied the 49ers or didn't beat the 49ers or we haven't won a game yet under Antonio Pierce in his 2024 campaign, something that where it's all him, he is completely trying to build his identity right now. He is trying to grow along with this football team, and none of this to this point has mattered. Till now. Every decision made, every cut, every signing, every position battle that he has to fill, even he, all, all the way down to Minchu being, na- being named the starter, right? Hey, here we go. Here it is. It's in front of us. The time is now. The time is now, at least to put your flag down and say, hey, we ain't the old Raiders no more, man. We're back. We're going to be a problem. Does it matter what happens moving forward? We're going to be a problem for you. You're going to respect us, and you're not going to want to play us. That's all I ask for right now. I'm going to be honest. That's where I'm at. But most of you know I break the game, the, the season up in quarters. The first four or five games, that's all I'm asking for. Set the tone. Bring back the exact thing, same thing we saw at the end of last season but in a more fine-tuned, complete package because now you've had this whole off-season to build it. There is an expectation there. I would be lying to say that there wasn't. There is an expectation there that I hope is, that I hope is met. You've got to let it play out. But that's all I'm asking for at this point. Now, come week five, come week six, remember that I said this because we'll have a whole different conversation moving forward after week five. It may even be sooner. But I'm giving it to week five because I really want to see how this team starts and what this truly looks like for four quarters. Because again, man, our defense playing even a quarter in vanilla style stuff, not really going like protecting themselves, like so not 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 the full engine running in a, on, on a on a high powered basis. Like there's a lot there's a lot of kinks and stuff that need to be worked out. There has a rhythm that has to go with the flow of the season. It has to be some plays. Like, Max has got to get some reps. Wilkerson's got to get some reps. Koontz, let these guys eat. Let these guys burn. Let's do, you know, like, let us develop. And then we'll come back and we'll reevaluate everything. Right now, I want to see culture. I want to see mystique. I want to see the Raider way. I want to see a team that is not going to roll over and play dead. They're going to punch you right in the mouth like we did at the last part of that season, what we did to Kansas City, what we did to, to the Chargers. I want to see that continue in the first four to five weeks of this season. And then God willing, we come out of it 500 or better. All right. I want to be two and two or three and two going into week six, five, week five or six. I want to be at 500 or better, right? 500 or better. So let's go Raider nation. It's time. We're two weeks away. We'll be back. We'll be breaking down next week, the 53-man roster, what it looks like. Again, you know, I'm taking my time. I'm taking my time right now. One video a week is what I got. Uh, I'll I'll be be posting up a clip. I think I'll I'll post a clip up on some of the other projects that I'm into and give you guys a glimpse on the inside of what Independently Blind is all about and what I'm doing with these kids next week. So stay tuned for that. But, man, let's just go. I'm ready. I'm ready. Until next time, y'all stay Raider strong. Night.